I want to talk today about one of my favorite games, Mouse Ritter, and why I love it so much. So first of all, it comes in this beautiful box set, and it is as cute as can possibly be. Um, but apart from the wonderful art style, the rules and the things contained in it uh, have so many fantastic ideas that even if you never actually play it for yourself, um, you are uh, almost guaranteed to leave with uh, some nugget that can improve your uh, 5e game, something that can improve whatever game that you're playing. You can uh, mine it for cool things. Uh, here we've got table of contents. Uh, it was written, uh, illustrated, and designed by Isaac Williams. So we've got the triple threat there. Uh, well done, Isaac. So you'll see some of these. Uh, some of these things here are uh, highlighted. Those are highlights that I um, that I made myself. This is my own copy. I made it myself as I was preparing to run this game for the first time. Brave mice in a dangerous world. The mouse kingdom survive on the edge of collapse. A harsh winter or heartless cat could spell the end for all. So I love immediately that we get a sense of the scale and scope of this game. It is not Dungeons and Dragons, it is Winters and Cats. So like the cat is sort of like the dragon of this world, which I absolutely love. The settled mice huddle together, hidden in their settlements, in trees and burrows and walls, scraping and saving a tenuous existence. But you are not like those settled mice. By choice or by necessity, you are an adventurer. You live by your luck, your smarts, your bravery. With your friends by your side, you will abandon the warmth and safety of the mouse settlements and venture forth into the dark and dangerous places where other mice do not dare to tread. There is great wealth to be found by those that are willing to take it. The world is old. Great empires of mouse and beast have risen and fallen. It's a huge and dangerous world out there. It does not look kindly upon a small mouse. But if you are very brave and very clever and just a bit lucky, you may be able to survive. And if you survive long enough, you might even become a hero among mice. So uh, I believe uh, that as, as I was introducing uh, my friends to this game, this is what I read first and they immediately got the flavor of, of what we're going on. So what is Mouse Ritter? What is uh, a role-playing game? I love how uh, there are sort of these QR codes and links to um, uh, different uh, spots on the, the website where you can easily build a character, your hero mouse. Uh, and and he, uh, he says down here, Mouse Ritter is built on top of a long history of games. It is resilient to hacking and many systems can be modified, replaced, or ignored entirely. Please use this game as a toolbox to create your own. I love that spirit of uh, TTRPGs. So very different from uh, board games uh, like Monopoly. In Monopoly, the rules are the rules, and you don't dare change the rules. But in TTRPGs, um, the rules are sort of suggestions, and you can really uh, take it and make it your own. And immediately on the uh, second page, uh, we open up to uh, here's how you make a mouse. So no rules. I uh, know this is, uh, you know, this is how you make an attack roll. Or you, the first thing you do is you make a mouse. The world is very big and very dangerous for a small mouse adventurer. You will need to be very brave and always keep your wits about you. So in Mouse Twitter, there are only three attributes, which I uh, really like. Uh, so coming from a DD and d background, um, it was sort of refreshing to have uh, a not overwhelming character sheet. Uh, so this is uh, uh, one of the character sheets for Mouse Ritter. And as you can see, there are little... Uh, so your inventory is actually... I believe this is inspired by Knave and some other games. Your inventory is actually uh, represented uh, here. So this is your main paw. And it's not main hand, it's main paw. Uh, this is your uh, your uh, your body. So your um, I, I think you probably shouldn't be holding a torch on your head. Um uh, you have rations over here in your pack, and then you have your off paw, which is uh, you would hold your little button shield in your body. You have this light armor. Um, and the really interesting thing is the Mouse Ritter game comes with uh, these little markers. And sort of similar to um, Zelda Breath of the Wild, uh, after you, after, I, think, I, uh, I think after an encounter, after something happens, you can mark a use uh, of your, uh, your item. So if you uh, rest and you eat one of your rations, you mark, uh, you mark it, uh, and then, uh, and that, that's how you track damage across uh, across your weapons and items. So improvised weapons, they they might just break right after using them, but uh, real weapons. And look at this, that that is a D twenty mace. How how cute is that? Uh, so if if I were to describe Mouse Ritter as uh, anything I, with one word, I would definitely describe it as charming. And this is a dry erase also. 
so you don't have to worry about permanently using uh, losing uh, any any of these things. Uh, but how cool is that? You can actually um, arrange your equipment however you want. Uh, and there's heavy armor that will span. Uh, and here, here's an example. And you just uh, just sort of bend it, and it's already perforated. You bend it, and you place it on your character. It takes up your, your helmet as well as, and it's a little thimble, and I don't know, it looks like a colander of some sort. But that is your armor. How cool is that? How cool is that? Um, so th this is the character sheet. So uh, you can tell a lot about a system by the character sheet. So D&D uh, uh, &D 5e, it's got character sheets that are, um, uh, I like to say, as big as a tax form, as complicated as, and, and nearly as complicated. Multiple sheets with, uh, I think, two or three sheets is a typical uh, character sheet. Uh, and then a more crunchy game like Pathfinder 2e is even more complicated, which is not a bad thing. It's just a thing. And if you're aware of that and that's the kind of game you're going for, then, you know, great. Okay, so uh, for each of these attributes, in order, roll 3d6 and keep the two highest results for a value between 2 and 12. You may then swap any two attributes. So for strength, if, if I was going to roll for strength, for this mouse, I would roll 2d6. Uh, and I've got a 6 and a 2, and actually I'm supposed to roll one more. I just read the rule. Uh, so three. So uh, I've got a 9 for my strength. So let's actually just go ahead and make, let's go ahead and make a little mouse. Uh, we'll, we'll go ahead and go through the rules to make ourselves a mouse. And you'll see how, how easy it is. Uh, and there's, um, there's a little uh, QR code down here, mouserider.com forward slash mouse. And you can just click a button, and it'll generate a mouse for you. So what was it? Nine. So our strength is nine. Uh, and then for next, we'll do the same thing. Uh, two, two, and two. All right, so we've got four. We've got four for our dex. So he's a big, strong, burly mouse. Uh, we'll do one more for our will. Four, one, and one. So we've got five. So we'll drop the lowest. Five for our will. And I, I kind of like that distribution of stats, so I'm, I'm going to leave them. Uh, it does give the option to uh, to switch two of those if you wanted to. Uh, for hit points, pips and background, roll d6 for your hit. So, uh, uh, so HP, sorry, is not hit points, it's hit protection. So you're not actually taking damage, but uh, this is sort of how well you can protect yourself, whether you're burly or whether you're faster or whatever. Uh, so you're going to roll just 1d6 for your HP. One. Okay, I don't love that, but uh, hey, uh, easy come, easy go. We've got one for our HP, and then we're going to roll 1d6 for your mouse's starting pips. This is the basic currency of the mouse kingdom, and I love that it's not gold and silver, it's pips. It's just, it sounds uh, so much cuter. Uh, two, all right, he is a, a weak uh, and relatively poor, uh, and uh, relatively poor uh, little mousy dude. So uh, normally you probably wouldn't write in marker, you'd write with a, a pencil or, or something else, uh, but just for now, since I've already got the, the cool mouse ritter rounded pen. Starting equipment, your mouse starts with torches, rations, two items from the background, and a weapon of your choice. Uh, your if your mouse's highest attribute is nine or less, roll on the background table again. Okay, so uh, so our, uh, our highest attribute is nine or less. So in order to compensate for uh, uh, lower skill points uh, that you roll, uh, you get an additional roll on, uh, on the background table. And you can take either one of them. If your highest is seven or less, take both. So I kind of wish my strength was seven, but uh, we'll, we'll leave it. So let's go over to uh, step four, roll uh, or choose birth sign, coat, and physical details. So this is... Uh, if, if you're new to RPGs and you just want to pick one, you can probably pick one. Um, but this sort of helps, like, oh, what kind of character am I? Like, unless I just always want to play a thinly veiled version of myself, um, then I can I can be a brave and reckless or inquisitive and stubborn or nurturing and worrying. So these are really cool uh, little ways to try different kinds of role playing things than you normally would. Uh, so I'll sort of skip some of these things. Uh, physical details, you can roll a uh, 2d6, and if, if you roll snake eyes, that's 11. So one and one. So this isn't the, you don't sum them up when you're rolling a d66. You just take the the, the digits. So, uh, so if we rolled, uh, so it'd be one and three, so 13. Uh, so we might have a skeletal body, and which makes sense with our one hit point. <laughs> Okay, so now let's take our background, uh, and the background is based off of your hit points and your pips. So the lower the hit points, the, the cooler stuff you get in the lower pips. So if you end up with really high, uh, really high hit points and high pips, uh, then you you get 
then you're sort of, it is self-balancing. So if you have the, the highest hit points, the highest pips, you are a pauper noble mouse. You have a felt hat and perfume, and that's all you have <laughs> uh, for your starting, starting items. Um, but if you roll snake eyes, if you roll one and one, you are a test subject, and you start with this a spell, magic missile, and a lead coat. So you start with a really cool, two really cool items. Uh, a lead coat, so you can either start with heavy armor or um, the magic missile spell, which feels really, really good. And you could potentially start with both. So for our little guy, one hit point and two pips, one hit point, two pips, we are a kitchen forager. We start with a shield and jerkin. Uh, so actually, the, the item that we had um, item that we had on our character sheet already, it's like it was uh, meant to be. Uh, and then uh, the second item is cook pots. I don't know what that does, but I'll take the, I'll take the, the shield and jerkin. Uh, so you would hold the shield uh, in your off pole and the uh, the jerkin on your body. So it would go right there. Uh, so let's look just a little bit more at some of the uh, most interesting core rules. Pack slots. Items in these slots take time to retrieve when under pressure. While in combat, your mouse must use an action instead of attacking to find an item in their pack. So if you have a torch or other things, a dagger, other things so, um, that, that you want to reach, um, it's going to take an action to grab it, and then uh, you can only easily use the things that are in your paws, your, your main paw or your off paw. Uh, so I really like that um, as a way to balance the action economy, and it sort of prevents the, uh, the, the common D&D trope of I stick everything in my pack and we don't really worry about uh, what we're carrying. Uh, you're able to make more interesting choices that way. So for conditions... Um, each condition must be placed in an inventory slot and conditions are negative effects that are suffered by your mouse. So rather than like a, a long list of conditions that you might suffer, um, each, uh, each adventure sort of has its own, um, its own punch card. So this is for the adventure, the chapel of eternal peace. Um, and there there's medicinal herbs and catnip and dry wafers. So th these are all the cool different things you can uh, potentially, uh, obtain in that adventure. But also the conditions are you're blind, cannot see all attacks are impaired. Or if you're familiar with D&D, with disadvantage, uh, or I believe uh, you you roll with a D4 instead of whatever it is. Um, we'll, we'll double check on that. So this is blind. You might be mellow instead. Uh, so there, there's different conditions, uh, and as you get conditions, they fill up your inventory slots, which is a, a really interesting way to handle that. Uh, and you can clear when you clear the conditions, you actually remove it from your in inventory slot, and you can hold something else there. Um, conditions can only be removed by meeting their clear requirement, usually a short, long, or full rest. Most items have three usage dots, which was which is what we are showing right here. When all three dots are marked on an item, it is depleted or destroyed. Usage dots can be cleared from weapons or armor for ten percent of the original cost per dot cleared. Uh, so if I wanted, if if my light armor was um, was uh, destroyed, I can pay a thirty percent of the light armor cost uh, when I'm back in uh, the town um, to to fix it. And speaking of the town, there is this uh, super cute little map, Welcome to Brickport. Um, and there is a keyed uh, guide for uh, all the different locations um, and adventure uh, uh, hooks and different people you can talk to in Brickport, uh, which I just think is uh, so absolutely charming. You can just imagine your little, your little mice living here or uh, coming there to rest as they are on their adventures. So for weapons, armor, and ammunition, after a fight, you roll a d6 for each item that was used during the fight. So if I attack with my mace during the fight, after the fight is over, I would roll 1d6 and hey, I got a 6. Uh, so on a 4 to 6, you mark usage. Uh, and that's actually something that um, you have to get used to because uh, Mouse Ritter is a roll under system rather than roll over. So... Uh, bigger numbers on the dice is usually less good for you. Um, so we'll get to, to more of that in a second. Uh, there's rations. Uh, you mark a usage after each meal and then other gear. If it's used in a way that could break or deplete it, the GM may ask you to mark a usage. So maybe you fall off a thing and you say, hey, can I hold my shield out in front of me to help me break my fall? The GM might say, yes, you don't take damage, but mark a usage on your armor. That kind of thing might, might be allowed. Uh, there's encumbrance and banking and then uh, weapons. Super duper simple, but full of flavor, which is something that I just, I really love about this, this system. So improvised weapons, you just roll a d6, and then you always mark a usage after a fight. Uh, light weapons, uh, so they deal the same amount of damage, but they're more, uh, they're more hardy. So a, a needle or a dagger, uh, they, uh, if attacking with two weapons, you can, so you can uh, dual wield these. So if you attack with two weapons, roll both dice and use the best result. So if I'm dual wielding a, a needle and a dagger, I'll roll two and then Okay, I've dealt six damage, which is uh, which is pretty cool. 
and it costs 10 pips. Light or range is, again, D6, so there's not a, a widespread of damage kinds, but they each have a very flavorful kind of thing. So uh, this is ranged. Uh, you have stones and a pouch, so the, the ammo takes up a body slot, and then uh, the, the sling here takes up a main pole. So heavy, it takes up uh, two poles, and it's going to deal D10 damage. Medium uh, weapons are going to deal D6 or D8, depending on if it's a main pole or if you're holding it in both hands. Um, and then a heavy ranged uh, it takes up both paws, uh, and it's a D8 uh, damage at range, which is uh, so uh, D6 uh, to D8. And then if you have a big heavy weapon that's also very, very expensive, then it's going to cost 40 pips. Uh, armor, uh, so damage is, is pretty straightforward. Uh, armor prevents one damage. So if you take two damage and you're wearing, uh, so our little mouse, uh, he's probably very thankful for his armor. So if, if he were to take uh, two damage instead of dying, uh, well, I'll get to that in a second. So take, instead of taking two damage, he would just take one damage. And then and then I believe you take damage to, to some of your stats is how that works. Um, so heavy armor uh, prevents one damage. It takes two body slots. They both prevent one damage, but this takes your offhand and your body slot. But for, with heavy armor, you can wield something like something with both paws to deal more damage. A sort of different way to do to, to get to the same uh, thing. Torches and lanterns, rations, eating a ration and spending a watch resting will heal all of your hit points or uh, hit protection rather. And you have a pit purse as well. So how to play that? This is this is really where I think it gets um, uh, quite interesting. So saves to make a save. So if 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 you're uh, familiar with uh, with D and D or any other TTRPG, to make a save, uh, roll a d20. If the result is less than or equal to the relevant attribute, your mouse succeeds. So if if I'm forced to make a strength save with this mouth uh, with this uh, with this mouse, uh, I might roll this giant d20, um, and I rolled a 16. And normally that's good. Uh, but in Mouse Rider, if I roll more than my stat, then I, I failed. I failed that strength save. So I could roll uh, from 1 to 9, and I would save on this. But for my dex, which is my lowest, I'd have to roll 1, 2, 3, or 4. So I've got a really low chance of getting this, but I've got you know roughly 50% chance of, of getting the 9. So that's how saves work. It's a roll under system. For me personally, my, my smooth brain, I was unable to uh, to really get used to that. But I'm sure with uh, w with more play, I could, I could definitely... Um, uh, I, I, could, I could definitely uh, get used to that. Opposed saves. If your mouse and another character are competing, you both make saves, and the lowest successful roll wins. So if, if I'm fighting another uh, a mouse and their strength is 5, uh, and then they roll a 6, uh, but I roll, uh, say I roll a 7. It's not a d20, but just go with me. So if they roll a 6 and I roll a 7, so they've rolled less, uh, but they they have rolled above their, their strength stat, so they'll still fail, uh, so mine is the highest or the lowest successful result, which is a really um, clean way to do it. Really, really clean way to do it. I, I, I love how that works. Uh, advantage to disadvantage, you're used to that. Uh, combat. Uh, if you attack unsuspecting foes, your mouse and any allies aware of the plan go first, which I like. On your turn in combat round, uh, your mouse can move up to 12 inches. And how cute is that? 12 inches. Uh, and you can actually just measure that out in inches uh, at your table and perform an action. Actions can be anything uh, from negotiating, attacking, fling, or performing a risky gambit, like tripping or disarming an opponent. So attacks always hit. I love that uh, so much. That saves so much time. Um, it cuts out uh, all of the, the slow, uh, or much of the slow moments in, in games like D&D, &D, where you attack, can you miss, and you attack, can you miss, or you attack, can you roll this to see if you hit, and then you confer with the GM to see if it meets the AC and this and that. No, if, if I roll this, so say I've got a, a D6, this D6 weapon in my hand, I roll a 3. I deal 3 damage. I deal 3 damage. Uh, and do that much damage to an opponent minus their armor. A super clean way to do it. When an attack is impaired, such as firing into cover or fighting while grappled, you roll a d4 for damage regardless of the weapon. So again, another really smart way to do this. So my weapon is normally a d6, but it's impaired, so I'm just going to decrement the die down to a d4. Uh, so again, uh, incredibly smart way to do it. When an attack is enhanced uh, by a gambit uh, or a vulnerable opponent, then you get to roll a d12. Uh, so D12, uh, the, the least appreciated, best die in, 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 the, in the game. Uh, the, you get to roll a D12 if your uh, attack is enhanced by something. Um, so hit points, in, uh, so hit protection, and I, again, I get something else I can't get used to, but um, again, smooth brain. Uh, damage is dealt first to a creature's hit protection, HP. This represents the creature's ability to avoid or shrug off real damage. So 
in D&D, &D, uh, maybe you take two, two uh, hit points of damage, uh, maybe it's like a small cut. But in Mouse Ritter, uh, if you take uh, two hit points of damage, or uh, two, uh, two damage, uh, and you have that, that much hit protection, you've avoided the attack. Like, so it, it's reduced your luck by that much. Um, but, you know, so that's, that's the idea. And, you know, depend, arguably that's how it works in D&D &D as well, but that, that's, that's not how it's uh, in common usage uh, too often. Uh, once HP is depleted, damage is dealt to strength. After taking strength damage, so uh, after we take one damage, uh, so if we take two damage, um, then it will be reduced to one, and our hit points will be uh, set to zero. So our current hit points will be zero, and then any further damage will be dealt to our strength. The creature must make a strength save. So after taking strength damage, you have to make a strength save. If they succeed, they're still able to fight. If they fail, they take critical damage. When a creature takes critical damage, they take an injured condition. So it's something that you would place here on your uh, on your character sheet. They take an injured condition and are incapacitated until tended to by an ally or uh, and take a short rest. If an incapacitated creature is left untended for six exploration turns, they die. So a certain number of rounds or a certain period of time. If a creature has their strength reduced to zero, they are dead. If dex is reduced to zero, they're unable to move. And if will is reduced to zero, they're reduced to insensibility. When your mouse dies, roll up a new one. The GM should introduce them as soon as possible. Getting back to the game quickly is more important than realism. Okay, so uh, fantastic advice here. Uh, your character dies. Um, you know, don't cry for me, Argentina. Just just roll a new, new mouse uh, and get back into the game. Uh, but a really interesting way that so there's there's so few stats here, but each stat is used as sort of its own uh, hit point pool, so to speak, and they each affect. So uh, it's not as fiddly as as D and D, where like if like uh, some some um, undead creature attacks you, it, it reduces your hit point maximum or it reduces your strength and this and that. So th that kind of stuff or reduces your intelligence. Those things um, are really annoying to do because that that number um, affects like two or three or four other different things. So like it affects your skills and it affects uh, your saves and it affects your chance to hit and like uh, tons of things. So changing stats in D&D is really quite annoying um, and, and difficult to do, honestly. So I, I just generally avoid doing that. But in Mouse Rider, it's sort of just like a very simple uh, hit point pool. It changes your um, what, you, what you need to roll to save. Uh, and then if you uh, take critical damage, uh, you, you go down. Uh, very, very, uh, very, very straightforward. Something that I really like also, as you level up, you get something called, uh, something down here, grit. Starting at second level, your mouse has grit. This allows your mouse to ignore conditions, and for each point of grit you have, you may place one condition onto the grit space on your character sheet. I think maybe my favorite idea from Mouse Ritter uh, is, is how the magic works. So this is the entire magic system. So in D&D, there's something like five or six, maybe 700 different spells, and if you include uh, all of the other like uh, homebrew things and third-party things, there's probably into the th well into the thousands of spells. But in Mouse Ritter, this this beautiful little uh, uh, charming game, that's that's all of them. That 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 is all of them, and how they work is is unique as well. The the mice themselves don't cast spells, but the spells are actually living spirits trapped by runes carved on obsidian tablets. Spells usually found in deep and dangerous places. The creation of spells is an art lost to all but the most learned wizards, and they guard their secrets closely. Uh, so casting a spell, uh, so spells you sort of use them as well, but you can uh, choose to um, uh, you can choose to uh, use one, two, or three of the the slots, and then they recharge. When a spell's use, uses usage dots are filled, it is depleted and cannot be cast. Each spell has a recharge requirement, and there it is—the coolest thing I think in all of Mouse Ritter, and out of all of the cool thing that cool things that it has. Fulfill this requirement. Uh, fulfilling this requirement will coax the spirit back to the spell and clear all those usage dots. And then there's stuff with miscasts, but let me show you. Uh, let me show you some of the, the recharge abilities. So fireball. Shoot a fireball up to 24 inches, and then you, you deal some amount of damage to creatures within 6 inches, uh, which is a really a really cool way to do it. I love how it's all inches because you're mice anyway, and that makes sense. But look at this. Recharge. Burn in the heart of a raging fire for 3 days and nights. Heal. Cut yourself for d6 strength damage and sprinkle the spell with the blood. <laughs> Magic Missile, drop from a height of at least 30 feet and then touch the spell within one turn. How are you going to do that? How are you going to do that safely without dying? Uh, uh, like so, so each spell is sort of its own quest to, uh, to unlock again. Um, uh, catnip, um, 
Uh, turn an object into an irresistible lure for cats. Uh, for cats, so this is like the, the dragon ability. Uh, this is like the big, the big, uh, the, the biggest, baddest uh, creature you can fight. Give a cat a gift it truly desires. So uh, Nimble has taken a, a big inspiration from uh, Mouse Ritter uh, with their uh, with their list of spells and how spells work. Um, uh, this is something that I, I never got into uh, as uh, when I played Mouse Rider, I didn't get far enough but you can have hirelings there's war bands so certain creatures are actually um, they're, they're, they're not creatures that you can even uh, reasonably fight with just your mice you would need to summon a war band full of other mice or other creatures there's constructs uh, constructions you can do uh, really nice examples of play uh, uh, so the rules themselves are like maybe three pages uh, and then uh, once you read that, you're you're off to the races. You can you can start playing. Uh, there are some really good uh, rules for uh, running Mouse Ritter, uh, and for any uh, RPG really, make the world seem huge. So like give it the the flavor and, and sense of fantasy. Create situations, not plots. Uh, present the world honestly. Telegraph danger. This one is very very important for new uh, new GMs. Reward bravery. Yes, don't punish bravery. You you need to reward bravery. Uh, how to uh, make rulings. So all that sort of stuff. Uh, uh, monsters are incredibly simple. Uh, this is so. This is like the dragon, the the biggest, baddest kind of uh, monster. Cat war band scale, fifteen hit points. So it's not. It doesn't have eight thousand hit points. It's got fifteen hit points. Strength fifteen. Dex fifteen. Will ten, and it has one armor. So every every time you attack it, if you do, if you roll a six, you've only dealt five damage to it. A really cool way to do it. Attacks is a d6 swipe and a d8 bite, so it's going to attack twice. And every creature, something I, I love about Mouse Rider, every creature has a want, wants to be served. If mice pledge fealty and give bribes, they may be allowed to live. So without reading a big block text, like read aloud text. Just reading this, I know how, as a GM, I would play, uh, how I would um, RP roleplay for this cat. Uh, really, really cool. And I, I wouldn't quote that exactly, but in just one sentence, I get immediately the flavor of, of how a cat is supposed to be presented uh, to these mice. And then we have centipedes and um, crows and fairies and, uh, and ghosts and all sorts of other things. Uh, really cool. Um, there's treasure and uh, there is an example adventure site, Stumpsville, which again, uh, love it. Um, and there's just an extreme economy of words, but it is packed with flavor. Uh, a bunch of useful tables as well as adventure seeds. Uh, the uh, so the, the front uh, the front end papers is really used to flavor. Uh, okay, so th this this is the feel of what we're going for, uh, and then the back end pages are for uh, you know, uh, there's a bunch of different mousy names, a hundred mousy names that you can pick, and then there's your your surname, your last name, how magic works, and a bunch of other things. So um, I want to show you real quick. So um, this uh, the, uh, s some other really super charming things with mouser. So you've got your torches, you've got your armor, you've got uh, maybe some rations over here, uh, but say we're we're done playing, and I'll, I'll go ahead and rip off this uh, this this page here. We're done playing, and then like, how do I like how do I prevent like my mouse uh, character sheet from getting uh, mixed up with someone else's mouse character sheet? Well, the game comes with a backpack, and you can write your mouse's name on it, or maybe your name, um, and it is a little uh, a little envelope where you can put your character sheet as well as all of these little pieces in here. What a cool idea. So you just fold your little character sheet in half and you place place it inside your backpack. And then when you're ready to play again, you remove your little mouse, little uh, little, little, little pip, what's his face, uh, and you can, uh, you're off to the races. Um, the last thing that I want to go over uh, real quick is, uh, well, uh, two, two last things. There is a really nice uh, quick rules reference, best practices, ask questions, here's how uh, saves work, here's how magic works, here's combat. So uh, couldn't couldn't be any simpler, and it's not even two-sided. It's just one-sided, and there's a half a sheet of paper. This is how you play Mouse Ritter. So I love how you can just pick this up uh, instantly, essentially. Um, and this is what a Mouse Ritter adventure looks like. So we've looked at the we've looked at the rules, we looked at the character sheet, and this is what a Mouse Ritter adventure looks like. And each one is the super thin, um, this whole thing is an adventure. And that's all you need to run an adventure in Mouse Ritter. So the front is a, a beautiful uh, piece of art. Um, this was uh, uh, written by Madeline Ember. Uh, 
And on the back is a flavor for, uh, so this is a quick, you know, as a GM, do I want to run this? Here's, here's a little, uh, little snippet. Disturbing stories have been coming from the orchard. The peaceful harvest mice and squirrels who tend the trees a talk of strange magic afoot. Dents and vicious blackberry brambles, wandering pumpkin monsters, horrible rotten apple creatures, and a dizzy-eyed magpie in a glorious palace high in the canopy. Uh, and it continues... So this is the adventure that I ran back when I ran it, uh, and uh, I picked the first one. Mrs. Scuttlepaw lost her son when he wandered too deep into the briar. Rescue him. So that's the adventure hook. That's it. So you're in uh, Brickport, and Mrs. Scuttlepaw comes up to you and says, Hey, my son, you know, blah, 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 etc. cetera. Uh, so uh, th this is the structure of the adventure. So the front is art. The back is a quick synopsis and adventure hooks. And the inside uh, spreads are where the adventure is. Uh, where the adventure is. So there's a D6 encounter, so every so often you can roll for an encounter. It might be a swarm of uh, blue bottle flies, uh, a lone rotten applejack, swatting at a, f uh, so uh, it might be, so uh, it might be any of these different monsters, and it might be Louis Two Knives planning a heist from Rupert's Nest. So Rupert is the magpie, sort of the end boss for this adventure. But again, uh, Rupert the magpie, 15 hit points, 15 strength, uh, 12 dex, 12 will. Attack is a D10 pack or dazzling dance. Um, next attack is impaired, so it can do this. Uh, so it's the magpie that uh, is wearing like all of these uh, jewels and things, and it uh, it, it uh, hypnotizes you sort of at, with its dance. But Rupert the magpie has a want. He wants to hoard all things that shine and glitter. So immediately you get a flavor of what this this guy's going to do. The pumpkin monsters they want to eat a hearty meal. Uh, the bo uh, blue bottle uh, fly swarm they want to eat something rotten. So not everything needs to be combat. Uh, if you wanted to uh, figure out what they want, you wanted to role play. What are they doing? Uh, you know, hey, it looks like there's this, this swarm of flies that are around there and they're swarming around a big pile of rotten apples. Uh, Applejack they want to cause as much mischief as possible. So I know exactly what what these guys are going to be doing. Um, and this is uh, th this is the entire adventure. So we have some encounters, uh, some stats. Uh, the uh, here are uh, is a list of treasure. Here's just the tiniest bit of backstory. So when a D and D adventure might be uh, well into the thousands of words, it is quite refreshing for an adventure to be this brief and this packed with content. Um, it may be a little bit challenging for a brand new GM to run something. With uh, that is so that that has such a, an economy of words, so uh, there there might be a good middle ground between an adventure of, of this brevity and a, an adventure where you have to like study it for a week, like like some of the the five E published adventures. Um, but uh, this is great if you if you've even uh, played it once or twice, I think you could, you'd be able to successfully GM this. So we have a trail to the Bramble Town. So uh, just a simple sort of abstract map. So one is a, tra a trail to Brambleton. I'll say Brambleton, uh, menacing black-tipped vines and wild curls, tall as can be imagined. Wicked thorns peek out from beneath glossy leaves. So you read that. So uh, you you start the adventure. Maybe uh, there, there's a little bit of narration of how you got from from Brickport to here, uh, and then you, you read this, and then you wait. Well, what do you guys do? Uh, and then maybe they'll they'll ask something or you know this and that. Uh, thick vines blocking a well-worn cart track. Okay, if, if they want a little bit of information, or maybe you can just give that. A family of mice fleeing in exile but cannot get past. Okay, so just on just the other side, uh, there, there's like there, there's, there's a father mouse and a little baby and the mama mouse, and they're, they're saying, you know, please help us. We're, we get, we're trying to get back. Okay, and now, now the adventures have something to do. If caught, vines will strike back for D6 damage. If asked politely, they will move aside. How cool is that? How how cool is that? Um, so the first thing that that players are going to do is they they will probably well I I take my sword and try to cut the vine uh, and then you pick up it and you roll it uh, and it smack it smacks you for this much damage. You don't think that's going to work. You, you think you might need to um, use your brain a little bit uh, rather than uh, your brawn. Uh, and immediately you're, you're you're communicating what kind of game mouse ritter is. It's it's not all about combat. There is combat and there's there's a lot of that, but it is a a role playing game. Uh, so there's uh, all sorts of really interesting uh, things that are going on. Uh, we, we learn about uh, the, the, the Briar Keep and what's going on with the Queen and how, to, how do you deal with uh, Rupert and all sorts of other uh, really interesting things. Um, so, But the, the box set is just absolutely packed with all of these things. And each adventure, like I said, comes with um, these, uh, these punch-out cards where it has the equipments and statuses, any status effects that you might need. 
uh, and there are maps, and uh, there's also a second box set um, I didn't show you yet. This box set is uh, the estate, uh, and it gives you basically an, uh, uh, even more. So the, the, the initial uh, box set comes with uh, the core rules and a bunch of character sheets and, and you know, sort of a few a few adventures, but this is an, an extra box set that comes with even more adventures if, if, you're, if you're into that kind of thing. And it talks about... Um, it, it explains uh, that this is where you are, and I believe you, you live sort of under this house here, and you can travel to all these different areas, and he, this is how all of these adventures are connected. These are the different adventures. You can roll for them. There's the rumors, uh, and this explains what Brickport is, um, and all of the different little locations in Brickport. Uh, and then look, there's Aubrey, uh, Audrey Pip, the mayor. So again, uh, just absolutely charming. Um, it, whether, you're, whether or not you ever play uh, Mouse Ritter, this is just packed with um, uh, ideas that are uh, S tier, absolutely S tier ideas for any table, uh, whatever uh, TTRPG you're playing. And if, if you uh, if you want to take a break from whatever you're playing uh, and try out Mouse Rider, I would definitely, absolutely recommend it. Mouse Rider, Sword and Whiskers role playing, uh, to a very, very, very big thumbs up for me.